right, so welcome to Exodus chapter 13. We got a lot to cover today. I'm excited for it. Now be sure to go to my website again. <laughs> it's not rock on, but it's close. Exodus! Bradflack.com slash Exodus. Okay, so be sure to go to the website. There's maps, images, I put videos, um, archaeological digs, all sorts of crazy stuff on there. So, and then I, after after we film this today, I'll put the video in here. So if you're watching this, you're probably watching me tell you that we're putting the video on there that you're watching onto this <laughs> website. And I put it with each chapter as we go through. So, <clears throat> um, so it's pretty cool. Um, thanks for joining with me. I, I've been excited about studying through Exodus. I had a blast going through Genesis. I really did. And my only regret about Genesis is... That we didn't record it. Yeah. I think this is so much better. Yeah. Because we covered a lot of ground during Genesis, you know. A year. A whole almost a whole year. So but that's okay. You know what you know. I know I know. We 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 did this together, so we know. But now we're doing it so that people can join us and share. If you want to join us, you can join us online. Uh, or your computer or your phone or whatever whatever makes you happy. All right. <clears throat> so real quick review. Exodus 1, there's a new Pharaoh in town, a new sheriff in town. He doesn't like the Hebrews. There's too many of them. They're stinky or whatever. He's got some sort of prejudice against them. And they don't remember the great things that Joseph did in Genesis. So he starts to put his thumb down onto the to Hebrews. And then Moses is born. We hear about that whole story. And then we see um, that Moses grows up. And sees a Egyptian taskmaster beating on a Hebrew, and he said, "Well, you can't be doing that." And boom, he kills the Egyptian taskmaster and buries him in the sand. Whether someone else saw that, or more than likely, in my opinion, that guy who got saved, protected by Moses, went and told everybody, "Dude, Moses just waylaid this Egyptian dude over here," and now it's like, you know, gossip spreading. So the next day, there was two Hebrews fighting, and he was like, hey, guys, 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 chill out. Why are you fighting? What, what, what do you need? In there, he was like, what are you going to do, kill me too? And he was like, oh, crap. Like they know, what's, they know what's happened here. And so Pharaoh found out about it, didn't like it. And so Moses, pew, he, he jetted to Midian, northwest corner of Arabia. So if you're on the website, you can see all the maps of that stuff. Then we see him interacting with God in a burning bush that didn't burn, but it was on fire, but it didn't burn up. And he said, I want you to go back now. It's been 40 years. You're 80 years old. Go back. So, yeah, he was 40 years old, ran away. There 40 years. Now go back. So he's 80. So, so Mike's not even 80 years old. So Mike would still be tending to the sheep. He's not even ready to go back. I mean, so that's old. I mean. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so, um, he goes, he goes with his brother Aaron and his wife and his sons and they, his wife circumcised his son on the way. So now she's on board and they show up and they're like, Hey, people of the Hebrews, like, check this out. God sent me. Here's the, here's the staff into a snake. And here's my hands now. Whoa. Look at my hands, sickness, whatever. And they were like, yes, God is going to come and save us. Yeah. Let's, so they believed it. They believed and they worshipped. It says they believed and they worshipped. The beginning of the next chapter, the Egyptians said, Moses said, let my people go. And the Egyptians were like, no, we're not letting your people go. As a matter of fact, you've got too much time on your hands to think about things. Why don't you actually do more work now? And so things got a little tougher for the Hebrews. And now they started going, oh, no, Moses, you've made things worse for us now. So Moses went back to God and was like, God, I thought you were going to save me. And now the people are now even worse off than they were before. And God said, hold on a second. And then he went, pop, 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 plagues. And he attacked the Egyptian gods and broke down Pharaoh over time. That he eventually said, not only, yes, you can leave, but get out of here. Right? They were kicking them out, basically. So now we are <clears throat> now we are on our way out of Egypt. And that's 
That's where we are today, starting today's passage. A million people. A million to maybe three million people on the high end. A million on the low end. So that's like, if you've ever been to like an NFL game or a college football game and you got 150,000, 200,000 people there, we're talking five to more than 10, 15 times, 15 stadiums where the people, I mean, it, it's just a lot of people, okay? It's a lot of people. So we're in Exodus 13. So if you have your Bibles, open them up. If you have your app, open up your Bible app. If you just want to hear my beautiful voice, you can just listen to my beautiful voice as well. <clears throat> Bradford, please open your app. You're not listening to my beautiful voice. Okay. <clears throat> Exodus 13, I'm using the modern English version. You can use whatever version you'd like, but this is the one I'm using. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Now hold on. What just happened in, in chapter 12? What did we talk about last week? What happened at the Passover? Do you remember? When he killed all the firstborns. Ah. So he killed the firstborns. Because they didn't have the, yeah, the, the blood, the blood, blood of the lamb. right? So the blood protected them, but if they didn't have the blood, they were done. So here we see in 13, right off the bat, he says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Sanctify or set aside for a special purpose unto me all the firstborn, the firstborn of every womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. So he says, all the firstborn sons, all the firstborn daughters, all the firstborn sheep, cattle, whatever. Okay? So we're on the same page here. Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, you'll hear that quite often in this passage, the Lord brought you out from this place. Now, if you remember the four promises of the Exodus, we talked about those, I'm going to I'm going to write them over here because it's going to be. We're going to hit on that multiple times today, so I want to go ahead and put that on here. The promises of the Exodus are these. First of all, I'm going to take you out of slavery. Freedom. Freedom. Number two, I'm going to change your slave. Mindset. Correct. Number three, I'm going to redeem you with mighty acts of my hand. Yep. And number four, I'm going to take you. Take you to be my people. Remember, this is where the same terminology that you would say, will you marry me? He's saying... I'm going to take you. You're mine. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to, et cetera, et cetera. So on these four promises of the Exodus, which ones have we checked off so far? Slavery. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let's go back into chapter 13, um, verse 4. On this day, you're going out in the month of Aviv. And if you'll go back and look at last week's, I have the Jewish calendar on there. You can find the month of Aviv. It'll tell you which one that is. On the month of Aviv, it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this ceremony in this month. Now, hold on. He names these tribes here. And we've seen we've seen their names before, and I put it on, on the on the website, um, bradflight.com/exodus. I put a map, and it kind of it kind of puts the general location of these people groups he's named. And if you'll notice, it's basically covering all of Israel. So he's saying you're going to defeat these people because this is the promised land for you. So he's naming the people group. It, it would be it would be like saying I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go into Texas and take Texas. You're gonna take the Houstonians. You're gonna take the Austinites, the San Antonians, the Dallasites, the Fort Worthians. You know he's he's just and so he's connecting the dots of you're gonna cover the state right. <clears throat> All right, verse six. 
Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread seen among you, nor shall there be leaven seen among you in all your borders. You shall declare to your son on that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign to you on your hand, and as a memorial on your forehead, in order that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, see that again, with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. So what I would say here is we keep seeing this strong hand. So I would say this redeem thing is not completed, but we're working on it, right? The ten plagues, you've been given a lot of, remember they requested the gold, excuse me, the gold and silver and the clothing. They're walking out. So he's getting some action on that redeem, but it's not over yet. It's not over yet. <clears throat> Like, we haven't even gotten to crossing of the Red Sea, which is next week. So that would also be a great mighty act to save them, to redeem them, to bring them back to wholeness. Okay. So, verse 11. <clears throat> it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, just as he swore to you and to your fathers. Remember, he covenanted with Abraham and said, I'm going to give you this land. Where are they now? Leaving Egypt. Are they in the promised land yet? No. So is God a liar? No. But it just is not the timing. Okay? So we have to think about that in our own lives too. <clears throat> that you shall set apart to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So, <clears throat> so what does that mean, you shall redeem with the land? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. So, when you, when you do the research, uh, it's using the term donkey here, because it's a, a unclean animal of the same nature of horses, cows, mules, oxen, all that stuff. It's an animal of burden, and it's an unclean animal, technically. Pigs, which they would never do. Of course, it's not illegal at this point to have pigs. Right. They just don't have them. <clears throat> so, what he's saying is, there's something about the blood of a lamb which can even redeem or make whole an unclean animal such as a donkey. Now, if you read between the lines a little bit, what's that? What's that pointing to? And who is the donkey? We are. Us. We are. And you guys. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <clears throat> so, a blood of a lamb is what's required to save an unclean animal. Okay. Uh, verse fourteen. It shall be. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this that you shall say to him with a strong hand? See that again? The strong hand. The Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. So the firstborn calf, the firstborn goat, whatever, we're going to sacrifice it. We're going to say, Lord, thank you for this animal. And the sacrifices, they actually, they ate it. So it was like, a, it was a time of communion with God. And it was barbecue and it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So he said, this is a brand new goat, a brand new calf. And we're going to sacrifice it, and we're going to have cabrito. You know, we're going to have this delicious meal together. And we're going to remember that God is the one that provides through the womb. That there's nothing that we do. Like, we don't wave, wave a magic wand for... Blood sacrifices? These are blood sacrifices. Um, I mean, the barbecue, I'm sacrifice. <laughs> 
so while while we think it is a sad occasion now because we're so far disconnected from the food chain, we can't we don't really fathom you know the whole slaughterhouse thing. But if you think about it for just a moment, um, there's something in there where an animal is dying in order to provide for us. And so it is sad that you, had, you killed the animal, but it's also a great joy to understand that the animal is serving a greater purpose for that reason. So these sacrifices were actually very joyous occasions because, A, if God gave us, a you know, let's say we had a, a, a goat that we raised and she was, you know, the third goat or whatever, and now she's mature and she's pregnant and she has this baby goat and so we're going to kill that baby goat. We're saying, God, it's just it's just like the feast of the first fruits. Okay? And so I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> Where you're saying, thank you for this firstborn. I'm going to sacrifice this knowing that you're going to provide more through this animal. That's right, that you're going to give back more in return. The f- feast of first fruits is very closely related to the unleavened bread. And they're actually back to back. So the unleavened bread means getting rid of the the yeast out of your house, which we talked about that being a a sin last week, that even just a little bit of yeast in that dough makes the whole dough rise, get those bubbles in there, right? So a little tiny bit of sin is still sin, and it permeates through us. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread was leading up to the Passover, and then the Passover, you had the Feast of First Fruits. And so the Feast of First Fruits is early, because when is Easter? In the wintertime? It's in the springtime. But is it like hot spring, or is it normally kind of cool? Yeah, it's cool spring still. So the barley pops up fast out of the ground. And so as soon as you get those plants coming up, and you see that, that seed head on the top, you grab that on that feast of first fruits and you say, God, I don't have my whole field harvested. There's not even enough grain for me to harvest, but I'm going to collect this handful of this grain and I'm going to say, thank you, God, for giving me this because I know that you're going to provide for all of that. Is that making sense? 49 days later or 50 days later, seven weeks later, is what we call Pentecost. And that is actually when the wheat has finally arrived at the head. And they can do the same thing. They, they collect some of the wheat and they can actually say, God, thank you for that. We're ready for the wheat harvest. We're, we're putting our lives in your hands that you're going to provide. We're going to take what little you've already given us. We're going to sacrifice it to you, God. Does this say that I planted it? Dad Gummit, I deserve everything that's out here? It's a different mindset. It's saying, I did the work, you see it through. And if you're talking about the Feast of First Fruits, that you get that little bit in the very beginning, knowing that there's more coming, on Jesus' death, when that great earthquake happened, a number, dozens of tombs opened up, and those who were believers rose out of the grave, and started walking around the streets again. That's in the the Gospels. We've We've looked at that before. And so if Jesus, his first fruit of the promise of what's coming, what was his fruit that he gave when he came out, when he we died on that cross? Resurrection? Yeah! Yeah! So if a little bit of barley is going to end up with a field of barley, a little bit of wheat is going to end up with a field of wheat, a little bit of resurrection is going to end up with a lot of resurrection. That's the first fruit of Jesus. Amen? Isn't that awesome? So the firstborn is saying, you didn't do this. I did this. And so we're talking about sacrificing the animals. We're about to start talking about the humans, the sons, okay? Okay. So we are in, um, on, on 16, 
Uh, it shall be a sign on your hand and as frontlets on your forehead. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So, normally, what would happen is they would, in, and I'm going into what we would call Hebrew context, not what we read right here in, in Exodus. But in Hebrew context, they are not going to kill the firstborn son. They don't kill the human life. Okay. But what they would do is they would say, we're going to give a donation to the temple, to God, as a, a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for this life who's given. So you would give money to the church as a way of saying thanks to God for this child. Now, if you'll notice, there's a price paid for the baby. That price is what redeems or makes that baby whole or legit, redeemed in God's eyes. Not that their salvation is done, but like you are following these steps. Again, we're not asked to do this. But if you'll remember, Jesus, when he was born, when his parents came back, they, they were in Bethlehem. And they left and they went to Egypt. And when they came back, they went to the temple. Likely to pay the, the price for this particular law. Because as we know, Jesus didn't eradicate all the law. What did he do? Build it. He fulfilled it. He completed it. So even all the way back to Exodus, we see Mary and Joseph doing the things that they're supposed to be doing so that Jesus is still checking the boxes. Because guess what? We're about to see here in a couple of chapters, in, in about uh, six, six more, seven more chapters, we're about to see the Ten Commandments. That's going to be a great one to, to, to talk about together. We can't even keep ten. And then the Jews decided, the Hebrews the Israelites, they decided, well, we're actually going to have all these other ones as well. Yeah, 639 or something like that. Whatever it is, it's a lot. It's 600 something. <clears throat> we can't keep 10, but we're going to make 600. What does the law do? Does it save us? No. It condemns us. So what's the first fruit of the law then? A little bit of this is going to give you all of this. No. If the law doesn't save us, the law does what? Condemn. Condemns us. So if I've got 10 that I can't meet and I'm condemned for that, and I've got 600 <laughs> that I can't complete, I've got a lot of condemnation coming my way. But Jesus fulfilled it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, we're talking Exodus chapter 13. This is like an obscure, like there was who's reading this thing? And I see Jesus. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. And everything. A thousand years before he was how many years before he was? This is like 2,500 years before Jesus. Or 1,500 years before Jesus, sorry. Well, I mean, it went before Jesus, because Jesus was in the beginning. Well, before his earthly form, yes. So, in verse 16 here, it says, It shall be as a sign. The word there is like a symbol. On your hand, and as frontlets over your on your forehead, with a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So, on the website, bradflight.com slash Exodus, I actually put a picture of what the Jews interpreted this to be. Because again, 10 laws that they couldn't complete were not enough, so they invented 600 more. So instead of just saying, let my sign be on my hand, because what do you do with your hands? Work. work. When I do with my work, I need to remember that God, that I've got this going. God is here. I need to keep that in my mind. Okay? It's like wearing gloves with a little cross on them. Like I gotta remember, I'm doing this for God. I'm not doing this for I'm not doing this to make Mike happy. I'm doing this for God. 
And then it says, as frontlets on your forehead. So what, is it, what do you think that means? In the front of your mind. In the front of your mind. And when someone looks at, what are you thinking about? And you've got, I got God on the brain. But the Jews took it to the next level and they invented something that they wrap around their arm and holds the scriptures in some leather boxes here and here. So that way they have it on their frontlets of their forehead and on their hand. Yeah, they got a little literal. They got not a little not is it, not, But not only is it literally at the front of your head, but you're seeing that as soon as you look at it. And, and so, so it's constant on, reminder. on one hand, I'm I'm not upset about it. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it. Like whatever, if that's what you need to remind yourself. But then they they take away from that what the rest of this passage is saying. They forget that part that says that first fruit of a little bit is the promise of whatever it is to come. That firstborn. If I'm born. Once, the first fruit in Jesus is I'm going to be reborn again in him. In a new way, a new creation. The New Testament calls it a new creation. Okay? <clears throat> All right, let's go to 17. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although it was nearby. For God said, Lest the people, what? What does it say? Lest the people change their minds. Uh huh. When they see war and they return to Egypt. Because are they warriors? What are they? Slaves. They're not ready to go and attack. The Jebusites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Amorites. Who fought for the, the Hebrew slaves? Who fought on their behalf? Nope. The Egyptian army. The Egyptians were beating them, but if an, if an outside force was coming in to plunder the land and steal the slaves and steal the gold and whatever, who was going to protect the, them? Wasn't the Hebrews? Egyptians. The Egyptians were. So this slave mindset says, I can't do. Someone has to tell me what to do. And someone else is going to protect me. Someone else is going to provide for me. Okay. So we see here, God says it. In verse 17, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So he's literally saying they're not ready. Right. So on this one, we're not there yet, right? That doesn't. God God gave us a promise, mm -hmm. but it's not in the right time. Okay, we're not there yet. Slave mindset, not there yet. Therefore, God led the people around through the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, prepared for war out of the land of Egypt. Moses, by the way, verse 19, this little tidbit connects us to Genesis. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the children of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely attend to you, and you shall carry my bones away from here with you. He told them that in Genesis. So here we see them marching out of Egypt. And they've got gold, silver, clothing, flat bread, <laughs> and an old dude's bones. And they're marching out. And they took their journey from Sukkot and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. And he did not remove the pillar of cloud by day, or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, on the website, you'll see a map. 
you actually see a couple of maps that I put there for you. And we're going to discuss those maps now. I'm going to draw it as best I can, but if you want to, you're welcome to go to the website. If you've got your phone with you, you can go there. So we have here the Mediterranean. This is the Nile with the Delta, right? And then we have this is the the Red Sea, which is actually um, the Suez Canal goes up there now. And then we have the Gulf of Aqaba right there. And this is the Sinai Peninsula. Here's Galilee, the Jordan River, Dead Sea. And then over here, that's the Persian Gulf. So this is the Arabian Peninsula right here. So this is the land of Midian. That's where when he when he killed that dude here, it says that he went to Midian. So you're tracking with me. Okay. When he went back, he went back that same route. Now here's where it gets a little bit interesting. We see that it says that he went to Suko, S-U-K-K-O-T-H, or S-U-C-C-O-T-H. It's pronounced Suko, Sukkot. And that location, according to scholars, is right here. Or right here, depending on who you ask. So we see if you go this way, that they went to that, that location. If they went this way, which for me makes more sense, for reasons we'll get into, I think that's the direction. Then it says they went to Etham with an M, right? Like Ethan, but with an M. Etham, according to a few scholars, is down here. And according to some, is right in here. Now, for me, this is making a lot more sense because this is where I'm seeing Horeb and Mount Sinai here. Okay? The Catholic Church and Constantine's mother-in-law selected a mountain here and called it Sinai. Because she said that, that they must have gone this direction. Although, we don't see a lot of evidence. Like, if you have a million to three million people hiking through here, we don't see a lot of evidence of that. I could be wrong. But I just don't see a lot of evidence of it. Okay? For me, if you're trying to get a million to three million people from well, one place line. to some place fast as you can, you're going to go in a straight line. That's just me. Okay? So, <clears throat> when when they leave, I'm saying that they go this direction and that they're here. I'm sorry, this is not... This is Tyron. Um, Etham is actually down here. My bad. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's still out of the way. I think that they came over here. Now, whenever they started wandering in the wilderness, which is what we'll get to in chapter like, 21 or whatever... I think that they end up doing some of this here. <laughs> okay. But I think when they first leave, we see, boom, that they're going straight over that direction. Now, if you'll remember in the text, it said that they could have gone to the land of Philistines because it was close. Do you remember that? The land of the Philistines is... Da, 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 something about like that. Israel. So this here... About 300 miles. This here, like 500 miles. And not in the right direction. But they weren't ready to go here. Why? Because they weren't warriors. They were slaves. That's right. So they went around. So they had to go get prepared. And remember those four promises? Number one, check the box. Number two, not really there yet. Number three, i yeah, we seeing some strong arms and keep talking about it. Number four, I'm going to take you to be my people. We're not there yet. They're heading to the, the place where they're going to be taken by God. 
They're heading, they're on the march to a wedding ceremony. So for me, this makes more sense. And I'm willing to say I'm wrong. I'm willing to say, you know what? Perhaps. Yeah, if you present me with some other evidence that looks differently than that, fine, you know? No big deal. All right, now, here is what I want to go to now. <clears throat> we have looked at this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. Have we ever seen God? I'm in verse 20, chapter 13, verse 20. Have we ever seen God presented in a, a cloud or a smoke type situation? Probably. Plenty of times, I think. <laughs> Probably. What about fire? Yeah, when he took up the guys, came down in pillar of fire, wasn't it? And he, and he took them up. Uh, that was chariots of fire, I believe, and I think you're talking about Elijah. That's okay. So let's go back in Genesis. Flip over to Genesis with me. We're going to go back here to, let's see. Hmm. For chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. I thought I had it saved in my little ribbon here. Chapter 15. And let's go to verse 9. Genesis 15, verse, verse 9. So God and Abraham are talking. It says, God told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So let's draw this out here. What do we got? Where's my black one? So we've got a heifer, right? So I'm an amazing artist, as you guys well know. There's a heifer slash mouse. <laughs> okay. Um, and then what else do we have here? A female goat and a ram. So we're going to have... A goat. Oh, a, goat. a goat. And a, a, goat. a ram. <laughs> With his horns, right? <laughs> it's a ram. And a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So guess what? A bird and a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then Abraham brought all these to him, to God, and cut them in two. Oh, boy. <laughs> so he cuts them in two. So what do we got here, guys? And the birds, he put one on one side and one on the other. Animals. Yeah. And you got, you know. Blood everywhere. Blood spills throughout. Yeah. A river. All right. So. This is not what I would call a clean work site. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So the, the crows and the buzzards and whatever trying to come down and eat on this. He's, shoo, shoo, get out of here. Imagine how when they were cutting them in half, they had to break the ribs. And oh, they had to break, break the, the spine. Back, yeah. Snap the backbone, you know. And they didn't have tools like we have, modern tools. So they were probably putting two rocks and stepping on that. that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, I would say, an involved process. It's a very involved person. Yes. Verse 12. Genesis 15, verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and terror and great darkness fell on him. Then God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will live as strangers in a land that is not theirs. Uh-oh. What's it say? And they will be enslaved. enslaved. And mistreated for 400 years. Hmm. But I will judge the nation that they serve. And afterward, afterward they will come out with great 
possessions. Wow, does this sound familiar? As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, if you'll notice, in that member that said Hivites and Hittites and Jebusites and whatever, the Gergeshites, it did, it did not list the Amorites. Because God's not happy with them. He's saving them. He's saving them for a certain... Okay? When the sun went down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot with a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So, if you've ever seen an old-fashioned... Uh, I'm just going to use this as an example. If you've ever seen the old-fashioned uh, Catholic ceremony, it, you know, to go to Mass or whatever... And they have that thing, and he swings it. And it's got the smoke coming out of there. That's that's called a censer, and it just dispenses the smoke. The 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 um, what's it called? The hippie sticks that you burn. The incense it burns the incense. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and then it says, it says, um, on the same day, the Lord made a, uh, I'm sorry, when the sun went down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot, so let's just say it was a, a censer, so you just have an idea, you can wrap my mind around it, a smoking fire pot with a flaming torch, now you've seen a flaming torch before. It's not a joint, Bradford. This is a torch. <laughs> so you have, what is this? Apparently it's not a joint. Torch. Yeah. Apparently it's not one. Flaming torch. The what? Ah. And then this? So what's this? Ah. So let's continue here. So the smoking fire pot with a flaming torch, pass between these pieces. So when he does this, what, what he's saying, there's, there's normally two parties, okay? There's normally what's called the greater party, and then there's the lesser party. The greater party says, I am big enough, strong enough, rich enough, powerful enough, whatever, to go into this covenant with you. I'm the one who is basically authorizing this covenant. Okay, the lesser party, so that, that person would walk through here to start the covenant. The second person, the lesser party, would walk through these animals, parts. They would walk down the middle, and they would say, basically, they're saying, thank you for letting me be a part of, the, part of this covenant that you're granting, and if I don't live up to my end of this thing, may these animals, may, may, may I be like these animals. Guts. Well, they're in like dry land and desert and stuff, so it seeps in pretty fast, I'm pretty sure. But also maybe a little bit of slip and slide. <laughs> <laughs> so what what do we see back here? Abraham, Abraham, verse 12, what does it say? Yeah. <laughs> no, no joints. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and terror and great darkness fell on him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain, where is, what's Abraham's actions after this? Nothing. He was supposed to be the one walking through it. Yeah. So it says that this smoke and this fire both passed through here. So what does that tell us? That means that we'll just assign this, yeah. that one of these is this, yeah. and the other one is this. And there's Abram. He's in sleep paralysis. He's in a deep sleep. He's just hanging out. What did he do? Nothing. So the greater party passed through, yeah. and the lesser party passed through. 
God was both yeah. of them. And God was both of them. God I'm, and he did it for him. Can you tell Abraham to do it? And he would take the responsibility of if there was a failure or anything. He's going to, it's all going to be on him. So when Abraham fails, Abraham doesn't die. Through this covenant, God does. God will die. Well, God can't die. So that's a little foreshadowing, right? JC. That's right, Jesus. So when we see this, the Hebrews who have been keeping up with the scriptures, which I don't know how I don't know how many there was available, but they would understand this Abrahamic covenant. Particularly the Moses would understand the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? So when he starts walking out of Egypt and all of a sudden a pillar of smoke during the daytime or a pillar of fire at nighttime shows up, first of all, it's like, bro, what is happening? <laughs> but he would say, okay, you're going before me. You're going before me. You're doing this. So on the website, I, a couple of artists came up with some pretty cool renderings of what it might look like. I don't know what it looked like. They're pretty cool. So you can check them out. Um, I think, though, for me, the fact that he is still consistent in using the smoke and the fire connects it back to the covenant with Abraham. Because remember they said, you are the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pharaoh. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. I mean, to Exodus chapter 1. The sons of Israel are more numerous and powerful than we. And here we see in Exodus 15, I mean, Genesis 15, I'm flipping back and forth. In Genesis 15, I'm going to make your descendants like the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. Is God fulfilling his promise? Absolutely. Absolutely he is. So they're on their way to the mountain where he had the interaction with God. And they are making their encampments along the way. I really mind as many of the websites. So they're crossing, they're going to cross this desert and they're going to arrive and they're going to, they're going to see that Pharaoh has had his feelings hurt and he's had a change of heart. He doesn't really want them to leave. His pride. So we'll see that next week. But for now, I want us to, to think about a couple of things. One is, is God figuratively marked on your hands and in the front of your mindset and what you're doing and what you're thinking. If I'm honest, 100%, not all the time. I mean, I want that to be the case, but I can't say it's 100% of the time. So that's a reminder to me. Not that I'm doing the things for my salvation. I'm doing the things because of my salvation. I'm doing the because of the great love that he's shown for me. And that he is faithful. And his time, remember the four promises? And one's done, and two is not really done, and three is kind of done, and four is we're not there yet. So sometimes God has a plan that I don't understand. Or I'm not patient enough for. Sometimes he says, I'm working on it. Hold up, Brad. I'm working on it. Just chill. The example I've given before, and I'll give it again here, is if my kids say, Daddy, can I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Like, yeah, sure. Have a peanut butter. Yeah, sure. I'll make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, I get the bread out, and I get the jar of peanut butter, and I get the jar of jelly, and it's like, pulling my pants. Dad, can I have a sandwich? I already told you you could have a sandwich, man. Relax. Well, I, you said I could have a sandwich. I want a sandwich. Relax. Got to get the butter knife out. 
Get the peanut butter. Start spreading it on the bread. Dad, I want a sandwich. I'm working on it. Give me a minute. Right? God allows those things to come in His timing so that He gets the glory and He builds in us trust, patience, perseverance, and faith. Sometimes when we're praying for stuff, it's not that he has said no. He may have said no, but sometimes he's not said no. Sometimes he said, yes, now let me let the things fall in place so that it can happen. We just got to be patient enough to let God work. He's not a vending machine. and He's not Santa Claus. But he does love us and he does want to give us good things. But he also is not afraid to challenge us. If you've ever read the book of Job, that's a tough book. Satan goes before God and says, yeah, I know this Job character says he loves you so much, but that's because he's rich and he's got a wife and kids and he's good to go. And God was like, no, I know Job. Job and I have a, we have a relationship. We're tight. And he's like, well, that's just because he has everything. He's like, well... Okay, go uh, go do whatever you want to do to Job. Take his family, take his farmland, take his cattle. Make him sick, whatever. Just don't kill him. Don't kill him. And he does. And Job starts going, uh, what's going on here, guys? <laughs> Why is this happening? But he doesn't turn his back on God. And then God gives him back. Ten times as much everything. So sometimes God allows things for us to go through it to test our faith. But anyway, the whole point of what I was saying was just they had to be patient. Moses said, you're going to come out of here. We saw all the way back in Genesis 15, which we did probably back in March of this year. <laughs> um. And here we are in November, and we're talking about chapter 13 of Exodus. And we see a promise, you're going to be enslaved for 400 years, and the people that you enslave, I'm going to mighty acts of my right hand, a strong hand. And so we see God working. It's not on our time. It's not on our time. It's on His time. So we either have faith that he says what he says, and he's going to do what he's supposed to do, what he says he's going to do, or we don't. Abraham didn't get to see the end of the promise. It came after him. Isaac didn't get to see the end of the promise. It came after him. Jacob didn't get to see the end of the promise. It came after him. Moses, as we'll, as we'll read, spoiler alert, doesn't get to see the promised land. Doesn't even, he leaves the people out from enslavement, but he doesn't even get to go into the promised land. So he gets to see him again. And there's a couple other things we'll look at, but God is in it for the long game, which for him is an instant. For us, feels like eternity or it, can be. or it can be yeah so my challenge to you today is have god figuratively on your hands in front of your mind thinking about him and his things the things of heaven the things of eternity the things that are not just here that doesn't if you'll notice it doesn't say close your eyes and put a blinder on it don't do anything it says go work go on mission trips, go to do your job, go build houses, go, you know, sack groceries, whatever it is you're doing, go do it, but do it as unto the Lord. Remember that your hands as they're moving and they're working. God, I'm going to put you, I'm putting you in front, I'm putting you, I'm doing this for you. It didn't say just close your eyes and sit in a corner and wait. It doesn't say that. He doesn't say don't think. 
don't have philosophical ideas or questions. But he says, put me at the front of it. If God's at the front of your thoughts, that directs the, the travel of your, idea, of your ideas and your thought patterns. Okay. So thanks for coming tonight. Exodus 13. Exodus 14 is the Red Sea crossing next week. So don't miss it. It's going to be good. Hope you'll join us again. We'll see you next time.